Well, welcome back to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Boyson, the host of Inside Personal Growth here in San Diego. Joining me from all the way across the pond, uh, <laughs> we've got Simon Pittman. And Simon, I found through just my own curiosity watching his YouTube videos. Uh, for many of my listeners, you know uh, that I've kind of deviated a little bit. People don't have to write a book to still be an author. And Simon is one of those people who's authoring on YouTube. It's called Better Creating, B-E-T-T-E-R-C-R-E-A-T-I-N-G.com. You can go there to see his videos. You can go to his YouTube channel as well. Uh, he's got a lot of them posted there. Simon, good day to you. How are you doing? Good day. Hi, Greg, and thanks for having me on. Some great things you're doing here. So uh, really chuffed to be a part of the podcast. Well, you know, you say productive, creative life, and simplified. And I love that. And I think that's what people are looking for. But, you know, when you get involved with all this technology, it can actually become not so simplified at times. And I think you're the person uh, that helps to make it simplified. And I think people can send in, spend an inordinate amount of time on trying to make something more simplified when at times I've often thought, well, maybe if I just got out of piece of paper and a pencil uh, and started writing, it would work just as good. But I'm going to tell them a bit about you. Uh, Simon's a content creator and Notion ambassadors for all of those who know what Notion is. It's out there. It's kind of an open platform where people like Simon can create templates or you can get them from Notion themselves. He went came here by way as a theater director living in London, which is uh, Kind of unusual. You don't find a lot of theater directors that become productivity gurus uh, and minimalist gurus. Uh, he started Better Creating as a YouTube channel to learn new ways of improving his work and his life. It's grown into a full-scale content creation and digital download business. On Better Creating, he created weekly videos on YouTube, which I say you can go to. And he shared what he calls his Notion templates and Notion from scratch video courses to help you get organized um, and share great ideas and tools and tech on mailing lists to make it a little bit easier. Um, he's also, you can subscribe to his YouTube channel there. And as I said, he's been doing this since 2019, along with his other freelance director career, um, which is UK and internationally. He is an HEA fellow and ex-senior lecturer in the theater. Um, he tries to balance directing theater projects with his solo business content creating and his notion templates and tutorials as part of a wider digital product business. Uh, and he's proud to call himself a notion ambassador and a Microsoft loop creator. Um, we didn't ask him any questions about loop, but um, I know it's something that Microsoft has, has, has come out, I think, is it still in beta? It it's, in beta. it's 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 kind of both seems to have both been around for a long time and is brand new uh but um yeah they're doing exciting things and uh, so i've been kind of testing that out and seeing what i make of it yeah well you're one because i tried to get on their loop kind of thing to be able to do it and you kind of have to be uh i guess i don't know what the situation is but not everybody can get in to do it so he started this i said in 2019 the middle of pandemic when the pandemic came away, a break away from the theater, uh, this was something that occupied his times and it's turned into be, you know, really quite a business. So it's a pleasure having you on, Simon. It's a pleasure being able to speak with you. And I'm intrigued because, you know, as I was going through watching your videos, preparing for this uh, interview, uh, I think it, you would tell the listeners how you migrated from working in the theater director to becoming a YouTube creator in the tech and productivity space, which just doesn't even seem to go hand in hand. Yeah, thanks, Greg. And uh, again, thanks for having me on. It doesn't. And actually, I continue to speak about how the 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 mood, I'm, I've kind of accidentally become a YouTuber. And I, I think that's probably how many people kind of get started in this kind of space. I um yeah, I've worked for 17 years as a theater director and movement director. I continue to do it. And interestingly, this this kind of journey into I'm calling it kind of ideas, tools, and tech to help you have a, an easier life, make life a bit easier, perhaps a little bit more efficient, 
productivity, they're charged words, aren't they? Um, and I think, and, and I completely agree with you about the, you know, that sometimes a pen and paper is the best thing. But I think it was the ideas and the kind of the strategies and thought processes that drew me into it. So my journey into this was we had that pandemic. I found that obviously a lot of live arts were put on hold. Um, I worked for a theatre company in the UK that studied in a lot of schools, universities, on syllabuses. Uh, and so we started making content for teachers and artists and students for that theatre company for them to keep going, basically. They were going, please give us something. And I remembered that when I did my A-levels, I liked playing with cameras and photography and actually found the process of kind of sharing and supporting and help giving value to other people that you do a lot as in education or in theatre is the aim anyway, um, translated really nicely into to making content. So that kind of led me to go, well, what am I going to spend my time being creative with while I'm stuck at home and trying to, you know, find bits of work, took me into setting up a YouTube channel. It started originally for kind of documenting my process of trying to get my life in order. You know, I've been as a freelancer, many of us experienced that overwhelm of hundreds of projects and or not enough projects and loads of little tasks and different things to manage. Um, and so I kind of started decluttering my house, decluttering my digital spaces. I started making uh, as I read and learned about different strategies, I started making a little organization system in Notion. And then that turned into essentially what's become a kind of resource and a, hopefully an entertaining uh, platform on YouTube to share those tools and those ideas with other people to hopefully make their lives a lot easier. Um, and that's what's led me into the world of, of you know, no code productivity, second brains and all of that. Well, you know, you're a digital native and and this show addresses people across all age groups and categories and so on. And Sometimes some of the most challenging things that I think people who aren't native to digital uh, face is really like what you do. You've created templates for people to say, okay, you can go in and use my template and download it and actually organize your day. And I, I do know Notion has their own tasks template as well, but you've gone deeper because you've formulated in uh, other people's, uh, like the second brain with uh, Tiago. Um, you've actually formulated a lot of these things into there. And I think that that's it. And we'll get to that question. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think it's really important. But your work at this better creating helped you become better as a theater director, you said. Um, and you see this newfound YouTube career with these Notion templates uh, as a developer. Where do you actually see that going at this point? I mean, you're still doing, you have a foot in both worlds, right? You got a foot over here, YouTube creator. You got a foot in the Notion world with the templates. And then you have a foot, and obviously your love is still theater, I would assume. Um, but if you would address that, because there's a lot of people out there that are thinking about, maybe I want to get on YouTube or I want to create a side hustle, right? As they call it. Uh, you did it kind of naturally, um, but there must have been a drive behind it. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the drive was exactly was was the challenge of already being a kind of multi-hatted polymath freelancer, which I think is more and more common in the modern world. And I think the way that information technology has shifted, it's made it a lot more easy for many people to have different streams of work. And so I was already kind of juggling that as it was. So kind of trying to make sense of that and find a way to make that easier, less impact, less effort on me, and hopefully to then have more impact to help and pro provide things for others was the goal really. So I think um, the, I, I have to say, what I'm really finding is that, as you mentioned, the working for myself in this way, creating on my own terms and essentially i'm a you know if you're not if you're not a big youtube watcher i'm a blogger i'm a i'm a kind of a journalist really i suppose that's what it's become it's been about i'm finding stuff out that i didn't yet know and then thinking how can i distill this share my point of view and support others to discover the things that are helping me in my life and hopefully they'll help them so i think it's all about providing value and and helping people through what can be a, a challenge with 
you know, at the moment with income and all of that stuff, managing careers. So, but what's been really fascinating is that the, I think the, the working on understanding product, you know, these productivity systems and these ways of thinking, goal setting, making more space and time for the stuff that really matters. I was really inspired early on by people like Greg McEwen and Essentialism. And those things have paid off dividends in the work that I take. So I'm saying yes to less theater projects. I think I'm doing better work because of it. I'm being more intentional and more process focused on how I make the work that I make in the theater. And it's resulted in me, I think, doing less th less theater projects, but some of the biggest scale and biggest impact theater projects I've done since I started the YouTube channel. So that's been great. And I suppose because of that, because I'm perhaps doing that classic 80-20 rule, I'm putting, I'm finding out what 20% actions of my actions I can take will have the biggest impact. Um, I've then got this extra time and space to develop, learn, put that on a YouTube channel. So it's kind of got this lovely reciprocity. You know, I, I get a lot from it. And then I think by publishing it and writing it and putting it out there and just doing it hopefully a lot well it seems a lot of other people are also benefiting from that so I don't know where it goes yet but I suppose the way I see it is I would hope this would turn into a larger business where I'm kind of supplying tools and ideas to people where it's a go-to place to help people live their lives a little bit more easily well you are doing that now it's not like what it's becoming because I've found it quite useful myself and I think that while there are many people in this space who are out on YouTube doing this, uh, besides yourself, um, you have a certain way of delivering it uh, that's unique to you and I think very special. Um, and well, thanks. Yeah, I, I really do. I, 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 I just want to compliment you on that. I sent that in an email to you. I think you got to keep doing what you're doing because what you're doing is working. And you're you're good as a teacher, right? And some people aren't. They're good technicians, but they're not good teachers. Um, they don't have the patience. And when you do explain everything, you explain how it works, you explain it thoroughly, and your videos, the way they're cut and edited and everything, and this is a plug for you, I'm being honest plug, <laughs> um, they're well done. So speak with us about our world as it is today. Everybody, most people feel an overwhelm and it's complex. And you talked about Greg and the minimalist thing. In one of your videos, you speak about this mindset. You you provided three tips for becoming more productive with simplifying your life, which is what you just said. Now you're working on the 20% and left the 80% behind and making those focus projects better. What are the three steps and what are the systems that you built because it's really all around the systems, right? The systems that you've built to be more efficient and productive. Yeah, well, I think that the first thing that can be, if someone is overwhelmed, which by life or work or whatever, all the different competing things you have in your life, which many of us are, you know, in a in a in an age where you have everything coming at you all at once, if you want it to, and sometimes when you don't. Um, it can seem like the idea of bringing in other thinking and building a system is just another thing on the list in order to get organized and, and to make things easier. And I think that that kind of initial step is valid and is something that a lot of us feel. I had the privilege and advantage of just about being able to get by during the pandemic at home, not always working, just about. And as a result, I had the time to do that work. And I think that's how this started. I've, done, I've then gone, oh, actually, if someone just told me really good things that can work and simplified that for me, I might be able to do it myself and make life easier. And so I think it's true. Systems, I suppose, for me, are about a couple of simple concepts or habits that you can start applying each day or how you plan your year or just how you uh, think about what you have to do. As well, I, know, to, I noticed you, you know, read Tiny Habits. He's been on here. We've had, mm -hmm. um, you know, most of the guys who've written books about habits, you know. So for you, what were the little steps you took to actually make a big difference? You cited, yeah. I, I watched your videos, you cited the lady 
who who wrote the book on organizing. I don't remember her name now, but you know how you organized the yeah. lenses from your camera and built your sure. desk and took it apart and all these little things, but literally it's so you didn't have distraction. Um, yeah. right. Because that's in, in a minimalist. I mean, I even saw the inside of your house. Everything's neat. It's kind of put together, you know, to the degree that you showed us in your video, but, um, I'd really like to see what your bathroom looks like. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I mean, that's true, isn't it? I, I mean, I have the advantage of currently not having children. So that does make that a lot easier. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah I mean, absolutely. I think it when it comes to those steps, I I think there were there are three areas that I think is really useful to think about how you can um manage how you look at your time, the spaces that you inhabit. Um, and then I suppose your kind of digital world as well. Uh, so that's about decluttering space, decluttering the digital the digital footprint that a lot of us build over time. Um, and I also talked a little bit, I suppose, as well about adjusting your relationship to money. Um, and I think that that, because I think that time <laughs> is probably the greatest asset we have and the thing that disappears the quickest, the longer mm -hmm. you spend in it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my personal feeling. And so actually, how can you adjust the effort to impact that you make? So the, one of the first things I spoke about in that video, I think you're referencing is this idea of the effort to impacts yeah. matrix. Yes. It's really worth looking at. As very simply put, the idea is that you focus on the low effort, quick wins and the high effort major projects. Right. So there's some things that will be lots of effort, but will be major projects that will really get you somewhere. I'd say, for example, in my life, that might be launching a template, which will continue to support people and support me, or it might be putting on that one production in two years time. But the don't people, win. but don't people, Simon, think of in that quadrant, it falls into like four quadrants, yeah. low effort, uh, high impact low effort, low impact, high effort, high impact, high effort, low impact, right? So there is actually a quadrant, and I'm not certain if it was Stephen Covey that came up with it, but the reality is I think so. I've looked at that enough that some people are a little bit uh, taken back by the, the quadrant you want to be in, which is uh, in other words, what is my knowledge and expertise about something so that it's a low effort, but high impact that I could deliver? Really defining that, right? In other words, what is that? In your case, you had an expertise or you knew something about the digital world. You couldn't have entered writing templates if you didn't feel that. What would you tell somebody who wants to come over and move into an area where they don't know a lot about it, and then they want to do something in that area where it's going to take them higher effort, but they might initially have a lower impact because there's a learning curve. The learning curve is pretty big. It, absolutely. I mean, I think there's there's a couple of ways to look at that as well. That there's the there is that in terms of moving into an area and and where your expertise is. And I think that's absolutely right. I also think there's there's just on a on a day to day basis, if you're kind of, I think first of all to go into the area that's new for you. I think it's about kind of really unpicking what value that has to you and why it would be worthwhile. If you if you can't do anything but go into it and you're really you find you're passionate about it or you you see you find the drive to go and explore it, that kind of joy is a really good catalyst. Yeah. It's like playing to, the piano. To getting something right? Done, right? I mean, Sorry? let's say I want to pick up a musical instrument. I know nothing about playing an instrument. You're going to mm. find that it's going to be challenging at first. But the more you practice, the better you get at it. Who knows? You might be playing Beethoven Symphony in, you know, a couple of years, if you're lucky. Um, you know, look, you've been in the theater, so you can relate to that. People come in the theater. Um, I remember watching something with Arnold Schwarzenegger when he first did his first movie. He said he was a horrible actor. Um, he 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 couldn't act out of it, it, it at all. Mm -hmm. But he ended up taking lessons. And he was being coached by theater directors and people and ultimately, yes, became Conad the Barbarian or whatever. But my point was, is that when you get into these areas that are uncomfortable, you have to be OK being uncomfortable. Absolutely. I think that's totally right. And I think 
I think sometimes the overwhelm with anything like this, you getting used to, and that is a muscle that I've definitely been working on, is how to be comfortable being uncomfortable and working that out and just daring yourself to do that a little bit each day. But I also think that when you look at the whole, it can feel completely impossible. And so I think one of my favorite th- one of my favorite things that I learned in the last year around procrastination and about moving forward is this idea of um, essentially this what's the smallest first action that you can take because I think a lot of the time um, we now I forget the author the professor who talked about this um, but I reference it in one of my videos and he um, he talked about the fact that uh, motivation should follow action. And not yeah. the other way around, because I think yeah. a lot of the time we wait for motivation and go, oh, I need I just need that. I just need this to be in the right place. Or when I feel it, when I really feel I want to write, I'll write. But actually work out what the first action is, find out what the time and place might be that it would be like a good time for it to happen and start to kind of build that. It's what's called an implementation intention. So when I put the kettle on and get the mug out, I lay my yoga mat out and step onto it you're probably more likely to then do your yoga in the morning, which has just about been working for me. So it's about building that regular habit, taking that simple first action. And I do find that when I sit down to do yoga with Adrian on YouTube, if I've sat down on the mat and pressed the button, I'm much more likely to go through the yoga process. And I feel a lot better at the other end and can do the next thing. So yeah, first actions, simplify it right down. Don't take on the whole thing in one go. Um, those things really help, I think. And then if you know the absolute one essential thing you want to be spending your time on, if you can work that out and do a bit of reflection, then I think you're all the more likely to do it because you really have identified what is essential for you to be spending your time doing. It's great advice. And I I think the consistency of that is so important. In other words, if you're going to put the tea kettle on and then open up the iPad, I saw you And then you're going to have your cat there and hopefully it's not bothering you along the way. But the point is whoever Adrian is, right, is like literally uh, finishing the half an hour yoga practice, right? And feeling better about yourself because then the endorphin is going to release in your system because we can talk about all the chemical things that occur to one as a result of doing these new habits as well right? It's like getting on the total gym or getting on the Peloton or getting on the mat or taking a walk in the woods or riding your bicycle. All of these things are physical, but they're also stimulating um, oxytoxins in the brain, which are great for creativity. And your site is called Better Creating. And you're a big believer in systems that'll help us synthesize our influx of information. And I just did a interview with a guy from Australia on thriving with information overload, right? And his name's Ross Dawson. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's really important that you endorse David Allen, getting things done, Diego Fuerte, building a second brain, and their methodologies that you've included into these Norton templates because you believe in enough and what they're their systems are and philosophies is to do that. What's a, what is it about David Allen or Tiago uh, that you believe in their system so much that you would have gone to this extra effort to put it inside the template, even though at times it, I think it makes the template a little bit more um, robust, very mm. robust uh, and not as simple but you wanted to expose your clientele to this. Yeah, it's such a balance, isn't it? Because ultimately, those key ideas that I think really work within their systems, which are systems of thinking, they're the things that make something like Notion really powerful. You know, I think it's it's no good to get... And as you say, I think people, I find that my... The people that use my templates, if they first engage with those key ideas, then the template makes absolute sense. If they don't and come and go, I just want it to work. It doesn't always completely work straight away. But actually, that's like anything. You know, if if you set up a task list and put them all into a into a t- inbox, and then you don't have the habit of checking the inbox, you never get anywhere. So what I loved about um, David Allen's uh, book, and there's you know, 
I'm not going to distill this to one sentence. It's a kind of seminal productivity book. But at the heart of it, the idea that really chimed with me was you create a second brain. The idea of the second brain is you create a second brain that's for holding everything so that your brain doesn't have to. And that therefore means that you can then focus on having ideas instead of holding them, I think is mm-hmm. the famous quote. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that works on a lot of levels. Like you say, in a world where there's loads of information and a lot of things we carry, uh, there are a couple of processes there which I've kind of integrated into the process of using those Notion templates, which is really fast capture. So one of the first things I would recommend anyone to do when they're thinking about utilizing systems to make their life easier is how frictionless can capture be for you? We, it's a very productivity term, capture, but it essentially means the moment you have an idea or see that quote or see that movie, you go, oh, or that idea you want to remember, you have a really clear place to put it and it's really easy to put it there. So for me, it's turn on my phone, click new task, remember to do that thing, put it into the inbox. Or it might be, oh, that's a fantastic article. Click, click on the save to Notion extension drop it into my knowledge bank in Notion, and later I'll be able to process it. And then the other thing which I really like about these systems, Tiago's idea of a a second brain is about kind of being able to create meaningful connections between the stuff that you gather. Right. So a lot of the time we will gather all our tasks and we'll capture all those quotes and clippings, but they'll never really result in anything. We won't find them to redo them or we won't find the knowledge to reuse it. So the idea of power, which stands for projects, areas, uh, resources, and archive, um, is one where, let's say I clip a quote from this uh, podcast that we're recording now, because I quite right. like something you said. It goes, automate, automates into my Notion system, and then I link it to the next video I'm making. So the next, when I go and script my video that I've planned, I, oh, there it is. There's that quote, and it reminds me. So the second brain, when it works, and this literally might be paper on a table, feeds back to you what you need, when you need it, and means you get create more meaningful outputs or get more done more easily as a result. So that's that's what I love about the idea of a system uh, in that it, it well, actually- Well, you just mentioned that the, that the audio would connect to Notion, right? And I saw you talk about that in a video, right? Um and for those people who aren't technologically literate, you know, I know I have AI, I have Otter AI running right now. Yeah. It's capturing the transcript and that, and it's, I use it incessantly, right? The question is, is do I go back to use it and take notes and then put that somewhere? How are you finding that to actually integrate? Um, or is there a, an AI, yeah. not an AI component, but... Uh, a way for them to link. I know you you talked about Zapier and one of them and these various things that we could use. There's a lot of tools. How is it linking across? There's, well, there's a couple of simple tools. Uh, there's a, a, a Chrome extension, if you don't mind using Chrome, which is uh, Save to Notion, which will essentially copy the contents of a web page or quote it or link back to something, uh, for example, a podcast, if you wanted it to. Uh, and it and it will fill in database columns automatically for you in the thing. That's great. For podcasts or um, audio, I have used two. There is Air, A-I-R-R dot I-O, which is a little bit buggy, but very good. So that is essentially a podcast thing, which when you you can triple click on your headphones or click the air quote, and it will quote the last 30 seconds you listen to. There's also something called Snipped. So snip with a D on the end, I think. And that's a very similar, slightly more robust uh, podcasting interface. And that will do the same. You can cut a piece of the audio or the transcription if it's there, and it will hold that for you. And then I I, for, I really recommend to a lot of people, if they don't mind spending, I think it's probably like something like $100 a year. But one of the best investments I've made is something called Readwise. So Readwise is a, has a reader uh, but it's also essentially a place that you can channel things from those podcasting apps and quotes from your Kindle into Readwise, and then Readwise will integrate with Notion into that database of knowledge. So what I do is use all of those sources, Chrome, Readwise, those clipping devices. It sends it to Readwise, sends it into Notion, and then I find it all in my inbox of my knowledge bank, as I've called it. 
and then I can link it to output. So you've created inside Notion, a knowledge bank where the receptacle of all of these things that you do then automatically feeds into them. It's um, right. That's yeah, basically yeah. in essence. And you found five or six, what it sounds like different tools. So for my listeners, you know, we'll put links to that so sure. that you can have it. We'll also put links to uh, the, the videos that um, you've done. You know, I remember I go back to the late 80s with David Allen, and I remember it, when we were in his classes, he used to do, and I found this to be quite productive. Um, you know, we uh, we wake up in the morning, and as human beings on this planet, as it spins around again, we have all of these things, these to-dos. And he used to uh, have a hand a sheet out with a picture of a brain on it, and you do a brain dump. And it yeah. was literally dumping the contents of your brain onto the paper. You know, am I going to go help mom today? She's in the convalescent facility. Am I going to go to the grocery store? Am I going to feed the cat? I mean, what are all these things that I have to do? Because it literally left the rest of your mind available for creativity. It left the rest of your mind to be much more productive because you had all of these things. And I thought, you know, going back to, no technology in the late 80s that we didn't have to where it has evolved to today is really quite interesting. And that was the initiation for me in the late 80s was a brain dump, you know, just well, to I will all say, the contents out. huh? I mean, it's fantastic to hear that. And I will say, like, for all of the talk of digital, I'm still, you know, you see this, I'm still using paper. Like, I, I think <laughs> I think it's important for people to remember it's not the tools that that make the difference. It's deciding to think in the way and then going oh what will work for me you know like there's a company that I've partnered with who I really rate who make it's quite expensive but they're good um and they make really simple to-do list cards but they're great and actually if it's the right thing for you it's the right thing for you I completely agree with you if there was one bit of advice to someone who was overwhelmed and had a lot going on right now even though it's scary, the best thing you could possibly do is write every single task that's on your mind on a separate piece of paper put it on the table, mm -hmm. group them into projects, then order them in order of priority. And you probably quite quickly find that at the top of each project, and maybe even just a couple of the projects, you probably define the one or two things that if you did them, everything else would be less overwhelming, easier, or not as important. So, well, look, there's, you, you know, this yeah. and, and you've been around the technology world and I've followed this area so intently because it's something that there's something inside of me that's extremely curious, but, you know, mind mapping software like MindMeister or mm. like AOA, uh, which is a British based company, Chris Griffiths runs uh, Open Genius and Chris is a good friend. And, you know, you see people saying, okay, I want to dump the contents of my brain. Well, if you want a digital world to dump it into, then go dump it into a mind map and then take the things off of the mind map. And if you don't do that, get those big yellow stickies that are about this big you can buy <laughs> and just start drawing on them, right? And yeah. literally uh, mapping out what you want to do or what needs to be done for a project or initiative or whatever. And I think when you get in the habit of that, that helps to free up your mind. Now, you quote in one of your videos, Francine Jay in her book, The Joy of Less. And mm. she says that her goal is no longer to get more done, but rather to have less to do. So you and I have been talking about all the to do, 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 uh, but we haven't been talking about being. I fully agree with the Francine. Answer, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, this is the thing. <laughs> this is what we should really be doing. Less. <laughs> yes. So how do you have you personally been able to scale down the amount you have to do providing you more time to be, right? A good friend of mine wrote the the being and doing conundrum. Great uh, Hollywood producer. And I can highly recommend the book. And it is a conundrum for most people, the do and be, right? Who am I being? What am I doing? Uh, and we've seemed to have played this role throughout the eons of time, right? And I think one of the reasons philosophically we don't give ourselves enough time to be is because we're afraid of what we actually might see. Yeah, I, I think that's <laughs> really, I think that's absolutely right. I think it's it's why 
so many of us get, I mean, the world asks it of us. We're thrown a lot, a lot of things are thrown at us. It's a world of information and products and more. And it's very hard to do that. And actually, the less you flex that muscle, the less good you get at it. And and that's when we can become overwhelmed by things. And I've certainly done it. I mean, one of the drivers for me in starting this was, uh, yeah, I wasn't dealing with life very well. And this side of it is perhaps the most important bit. I think I think there are a few different things you can do in, in answer to what you know your provocation about like how might you. I think there are two ways to answer it. There's a few of these are kind of mindset shifts and kind of engaging with kind of simple ideas to live by. And I think others are just really practical and uh, actions that you could take. So I think for me, taking time to, for me, it's actually making time, time blocking in a practical sense to reflect. Or but to, you, you also say in one of your videos, not Pomodoro to where you freak yourself out. And I saw your screen, you showed a screen that you, I think you were trying to exemplify, I shouldn't say exemplify, exaggerate. Uh, you yeah. had every minute of every day blocked out on your iPad. And you said, uh -huh. no, this is not the way to do the Pomodoro method. Well, um, <laughs> the, the time blocking is interesting, though, because two and a half days of that are don't work. So it depends how you look at it, you know, so in, in that, it depends what you're blocking time out for, because often the time blocking might be in the morning is deep work. I'm just going to do the one important thing I really want to spend time doing, shut everything off, disconnect, do this. Or it might be to block out time to reflect or to not be working. And I think that comes down to that mind shift of thinking intentionally and going, what is essential for me? You know, what are the important things? And that has to come from reflection. So building a kind of process, you know, of some people might want to journal. Some people might just want to. I mean, for me, it's sometimes just riding a motorbike. If I go out and ride my motorbike on my own without anyone else for two hours around, you know, the outsides of, you know, out of London, a lot of stuff happens, unconscious practice. And you, right. you end up coming back and then being able to go, this is what matters right now. And so I think it's giving yourself time to see things like that and understand what that key 20% is, what really matters. And at the same time, you make, I think for me, making more time, you know, to have less to do, that also comes down to being better at delegating, automating, uh, and reflecting on how things have gone and then improving how you do things in the future. So I've been building in a bit more of that kind of effective reflection goal setting has really made more time and space. I also really wanted to list, I thought you might ask me about this, and I wanted to list a little set of things that I think are really practical. So time blocking, not every inch of the day, but blocking out time to do deep work, as Cal Newport would call it, is really powerful. And blocking out immovable time where you're like, that's it, particularly for someone like me who works on their own schedule, that's it, no work happens past this time in the day is really powerful. I love having a daily one thing. So I'm referencing lots of people, but I think it's useful to send people towards it. The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papazan, yeah. fantastic book. Really the key idea in it that people can take away is what is the one thing that if you did now would make everything else easier or less important? And I have a little tag in my Notion system which says one thing for today and it turns up at the top of each day. Um, and then this idea as well of being able to say no more. Because if we're overwhelmed, we're probably in some form saying yes, <laughs> whether consciously or unconsciously. So I've been trying to actively go, if it, again, I'm going to reference it because I wanted to do this for you. Um, Derek Sivers, if hell yeah or no. So if it's hell yeah, it's no. And I think in terms of me making theatre or taking on projects, that's been really powerful to only say yes to the things that really matter or really are like, oh my goodness, I absolutely have to do that. Because then you're going into the things you actually take on completely charged up and excited. And if you're excited, right. it's easier, you know. Well, one of the things that I think you've done a masterful job of is that you're the synthesizer of all of these philosophies into kind of one area through your YouTube videos through the templates that you're creating for Notion, 
uh, through interviews like these, you know, a lot of people won't take the time to synthesize this. I had a recent post by a woman who listened to Dr. John Raddy talk about ADHD 2.0 and mm -hmm. her revelation and the other book called The Distracted Mind by the professor at San Francisco State University that I interviewed probably about a year ago. But what I what I take away from these interviews with these thought leaders is this. There's a lot of things that are affecting the neuroplasticity of our brain and how we're wired and fired. And uh, Dr. Uh, Justin Kennedy from Switzerland was just on about uh, rebooting the brain. And I think you talk about rebooting the brain, but then rebooting the systems that we have that are supporting the brain, that are supporting how we think and, and is reminding us, right? Look, uh, people have notifications on their phone, um, which I think those can be incessive and those can be disruptors. Um, we have people that say, well, I'm ADHD. Well, that's a label they give themselves, but they actually can overcome the ADHD, uh, not just with medications, but literally, like you said, go take your motorbike or go take your bicycle and ride around a bit and get outside, right? There's so many things that affect how we become, quote, productive and creative at the same time. And it's a world which we've kind of all been delved into. And you have these, I'd like, you know, I'm a huge fan of your videos your philosophy and your tips and your techniques. If you were to leave our listeners with like three big tips to implement into their lives, right? Um, what would you want to leave this audience with saying, okay, great. You know, we've talked about David Allen. We've talked about Tiago. We've talked about Notion. We've talked about all of these various systems. You've given us some tips on some applications that we could use. Um, and you are the synthesizer of all this. So this is a very big question. In the synthesis realm of everything that you've come across, Simon Pittman, in his world, uh, what would you synthesize this down to? And what do you think are have tos versus maybes? Oh, it's tough. It, I mean, there's so much in there. <laughs> I, I, I mean, there's. I think there's something in there about... I honestly, I would at the moment, I think this changes from time to time, but I think this idea of decluttering and stripping back and yeah. move, and the idea of always asking what what would be less but better has been one of the most powerful things. I mean, what, I love that that got a new meaning for me because I'm a big fan of design, Dita Rams, less but better, a wonderful idea in design. But actually, if you think about that in terms of, your time in existence to 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 design engage with the idea of what would it be if i did design what i did today that would have the biggest impact on how i want to feel and be or how i want to help other people it's really powerful and and perhaps the quickest way to that is probably this idea of the the concept of the one thing i think we mentioned it a minute ago so i, I would ask people each morning to do that what would be the one thing today if I stripped everything back, that would be the best or better thing to do than anything else to, to move, to move in the direction I want to move. Uh, number two. So there's one number two, I think has to be um, learning the difference between goals and systems. I think we can set ourselves goals all the time and often they are result driven goals, which can leave you very frustrated and chasing something. So I think, the idea of the second brain system in Notion did fundamentally change how I live because I suddenly had this space to, you know, enjoy what I was doing and 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 have used that system to go to focus where I actually do work and put energy and that the goals become about process, not about results, you know, stuff that's within your control. So I think mm -hmm. that's very powerful. Number three, uh, do you know what? I think it is probably what we started early on, which is um, exercise, try and go to bed at the same time every night 
and don't drink coffee past 12. <laughs> I think those, those <laughs> things have made a huge, I love coffee. It's an <laughs> absolute cliche in the productivity sphere, but they've really made a difference because, you know, if you look, look after your health, your mental health, it's all the same organism, then everything else kind of follows. It's easy to say, harder to do, but tiny steps, and it really makes a difference. <laughs> well, those are those are really three great tips. And, you know, I, I, I'm going to use an analogy here, pardon me, but, you know, if, if you go back to the agricultural age and the farmer woke up early to either milk the cows or do the tasks that he had to do, but one of the things is you, you're constantly planting seeds in your garden with the manifestation of those seeds that are going to propagate into corn or wheat or whatever. And then you're going to harvest that, right? So my analogy here is this. We're constantly early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, wise, right? Uh, your sleep habits, as you said, are very, very important. Don't drink coffee after midnight because you'll never get to sleep. Two, um, oh, I mean, afternoon. No, oh, <laughs> afternoon, 12 noon. Okay. I thought you meant after midnight. I was like, okay. Um, the, it, it's been proven, you know, look, we have all these sleep trackers. There's a zillion of them, right? But if there's any one thing that affects your health and I think your prosperity is one, um, do you give gratitude? I'm going to mm. add to this list for everything that I have in, in my life, for everything that I've realized. Are you curious? Do you have a purpose? Have you established, you know, I call it focus is for free. Um, focus is something that you get when you have a passion about something and you have a purpose. Completely. Um, right. And I, I think we haven't missed it in this conversation, but if it was to have entered into this conversation, it would have been one of the fundamental things, which is driving all the projects, which you, me, and everybody else listening are doing. Um, and more importantly, my intentions, you call it the one thing I might just say, Hey, when I wake up in the morning, I give gratitude that my feet hit the ground. And I also set an intention. What is the intention for today that I want to create in my life? And simply saying, now, if I'm going to declutter this brain and get it out into uh, your app inside of Notion, I need to find the simplest and most effective way to do that. And I think for me, staring at the screen to do it, it doesn't it's work. Place. It's not the place. For what most. works for me mm -hmm. is if I make the list on paper and then I decide to put it as David Allen says, one of your mentors and mine, he, I think he used to say this ubiquitous device that just collects everything, which is what you've said across lines. We then put it in there so we don't forget it because yeah. the mind, I, he's, he's always used to said the mind is basically to think things, but not to keep things in it, right? So it's supposed mm. to flow. And that brings me to flow. That's the last thing. You know, the most important thing that we want in our life, I think, is that feeling of the, that we get of exhilaration when we're in those moments of flow. That's when the highest levels of creativity and uh, everything occur, right? And creating that flow in life is a result of a combination of many of the things that you've said, and some of the things that I've said. And I yeah. think if my listeners are tracking on this, I definitely want you to watch, you know, Simon's videos because the systems that will help you keep yourself in flow are on his videos, right? That's those are the things that will get you there. Um, as far as this philosophical viewpoint of how you want to approach this, this can be approached in a hundred different directions, right? And so with that, do you have anything else to add before we kind of wrap up here, this podcast? Well, great. I think that's brilliant. And I think, it, I mean, for me, that links not back to the one thing, but actually to this idea of real time and space to reflect. And I think, you know, something that's really impacted me is 
is is kind of stoic thinking and 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 that idea of really delving deeper into what really drives you and when you find that as you say that joy of what really does drive you is the catalyst to everything happening so don't fight yourself you've got to slow down and it's slow growth as uh, another youtuber matt diavella would probably say um i it's been I don't think I have much to add really. I think it's been a really fascinating and stimulating conversation. I've got a ton of stuff I now want to go and find out about. Um I hope that your <laughs> listeners find this useful. We're always learning and I'm I'm off now to learn about a number of things that you've mentioned, which I really uh, should uh, find some time for. <laughs> oh well, you know, I think in 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 again in due time, you one of the things you did mention was extremely valuable is the the most important thing we have is time, you know, in a week from it's less than a week now i'm going to be 69 years old and you never Dang. stop learning right and i think right. people like you stimulate people to stay learning and if there's one thing that i would say is just keep learning and use that knowledge and wisdom to apply to something that's going to change you and the rest of the world and that's what you've done and i want to commend you on you know, your YouTube on your, your templates on everything that you're doing. So thanks so much for being on inside personal growth and sharing your insights and your wisdom with my listeners. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Greg. It's been great.